From the People's Church in Toronto, Canada, join international Bible teacher Charles Price as he delivers a fresh perspective on God's Word, eternal truth transforming your life. If you've been with us for the past three weeks, we've been on a journey to Southern Africa. We've brought you stories of how the African church is responding to the HIV AIDS pandemic. And we've told you about ordinary people who bring the love of Jesus Christ in very practical ways to widows and orphans and to people in desperate need. And we've shared with you the vision of our partner organizations, Hands at Work in Africa and Somebody Cares. These African-based ministers reach out to those affected by the HIV AIDS crisis and we've asked you to consider investing in their work and to donate to the wonderful work that is going on in South Africa, Mozambique, and Malawi. And from all over Canada and the United States, people have responded generously. And I want to thank you so very much for your wonderful contributions. And we're pleased that through Living Truth, these funds will finance the building of life centers, places which will bring relief and hope to those who are suffering and be a means of the local churches reaching into their communities with compassion and help and with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that you can still contribute to this work. You may have already contributed financially and we thank you for that. Perhaps you're still considering doing so and for a short time we are still able to receive funds designated for life centers in Africa. I hope you want to be part of this and take up this opportunity. When I got back from Africa, I shared with the congregation of the People's Church in Toronto a message that was on my heart. And I want to share this with you today. Often our greatest difficulties and fears are God's means of working in us and then through us. I believe this is true in parts of Africa where the tragic AIDS pandemic has been the means of so many turning to God and it can be legitimately described as revival in many cases. Sometimes our biggest foes become our best friends as we allow them to drive us to a greater dependence on God. I hope you'll stay with me today for these reflections and that you'll hear God speak to your own heart. But first, I'd like you to see a short recap of these past three weeks of special programming. Here is Journey to Africa. Join us on a journey to Africa. Our first stop was in South Africa, where we met our partner organization, Hands at Work in Africa, founded by George Snayman. There, we learned about life centers. These are community centers which run daytime programs to assist people affected by the AIDS epidemic. The goal of these special editions of Living Truth, shot on location in Africa, is to raise funds to build more life centers in Africa. Two hours north of Johannesburg in South Africa, we went to a place called Bushbuck Ridge. This is an area where Hands at Work wants to build a new life center. There we met orphan sisters Constance and Ellery. The girls are listless and have no energy because of a lack of food. And it's not only their bodies that are weak. Their spirits are weak from constant sorrow and rejection. Ellery's eyes reflect her pain. What abuse has she already suffered? We can only guess. She has not grieved the death of her parents. She is always hungry. She has no home. All she can do is survive each day. Constance is younger and more resilient. She wants her older sister to join in a game. Ellery's hands join in the game, but her mind is somewhere else. A place where smiling is impossible. What will it take to make Ellery smile again? Then we went to White River, 
where Hands at Work has already established a life center. We saw what a difference it had made in the life of Bethwell. He's a teenager looking after his two younger brothers. Eighteen-year-old Bethwell is the oldest in this family of three boys. They come to the Life Center each day after school for a hot meal and the company of other teens like themselves. Bethwell remembers only too well the times they didn't have enough food. His father died six years ago and he hasn't heard from his mother in a decade. That left Bethwell as head of this young family. Yeah, yeah, it is hard. It is hard because uh, I'm not the stage of being a parent or, or something, but I'm trying so very hard to, to, to teach them what is right it is. Today, the boys are well fed and well dressed, but that was not the case when Bethwell's father died. That's where Hands at Work comes in. Their goal is to provide support to child headed households through a life center like this one. Then children can continue to live in their own communities, in their own homes. How would you survive if you didn't have this center? Uh, I think it, it, it will be too, too difficult for me. Because maybe I, uh, maybe I could have to go and find some jobs on me to work in order to, to get some food and then some lunch school. So, so it will be really difficult. Then we traveled to Mozambique, a Portuguese-speaking country on the southeast coast of Africa. There we met two sisters who have been helped by our partner organization, Hands at Work in Africa. These orphans are now connected to a life center. Hands at Work searched the town for a widow or granny with a compassionate heart, someone to care for the children after their mother's death. They found Fatima. Fatima was a distant relative, an aunt. She was willing to take the children into her home, but didn't have the resources to take care of them. She already had a grandchild to care for. So Hands at Work provided all that they needed. It's a good arrangement. Fatima has lost all her family to AIDS. The girls are a welcome addition to her household, and they're not a financial burden. Eles levam essas crianças para lá na associação, dão de comer, dão caderno, lapiseiras, sabão. In the Namatonda region of Mozambique, we met Chico, a man whose life had become desperate. There is no life center in his community. Hands at work would like to build one, if the resources can be found. Chico's wife died in 2003 of AIDS. He chose to look after his son, Joas, and daughter, Luisa, by himself. This is rare in a culture where men don't often take sole responsibility for their children. It's hard being a single father. He's embarrassed to do the family laundry with the women of the village. Instead, Chico goes off to a quiet area where no one will see. Last spring, his situation went from bad to desperate. Chico was in an accident at work. He lost the use of his shoulder. Since then, he and his children have struggled to survive.
Eu não busco a gente, porque eu não vou, não te alevo, não te alevo, não te alevo, não te alevo, não te alevo. The third and final stop on our journey to Africa was Malawi. There, our partner organization is Somebody Cares. It was founded by Teresa Malila. In a patriarchal society, Teresa is unique. She is a regional chief, a title inherited from her father. She wields significant authority and is widely respected by both men and women. Four years ago, she started a ministry to help those afflicted by AIDS in Malawi. It's her life's calling. I know it was a definite calling from the Lord. I know because he spoke to me over a three-year period, even giving me the name of the ministry, which was Somebody Cares. Somebody Cares had humble beginnings. At first, Teresa worked by herself. All I had was my Bible and a bottle of oil. So I just used to walk into communities and just pray for the dying and encourage them, pray for children, encourage them, talk to them about Jesus, and then anoint those that were dying. And that's all I did. Soon, others touched by her work joined in. Many of the volunteers are women. They help the sick with practical chores and provide spiritual support. Women know all too well the impact of HIV AIDS. In Malawi, they are the hardest hit. There are more women infected by HIV AIDS than men. Tell me, Teresa, why is this a woman's issue? Because the women bear the brunt of the effect of HIV AIDS. They have got no control over their bodies. I mean, they cannot say no to sex to their husbands. And they have to take care of their husbands when their husbands get ill. They have to carry water. They have to do the firewood. They have to cook. They have to take care of the children. And in Malawi, we met Shakutera, a 13-year-old orphan who suffered from the stigma of AIDS. In the crowd, you'll spot a girl of about 12 years old. She doesn't have anything nice to wear. All she has is this shirt, a shirt that is tattered and worn. No one in her village has fixed it or given her something else to wear. She's often ignored because her parents died of AIDS. People are afraid to talk about HIV also to let you know their status because there's stigma attached to it. They could be avoided just like the way lepers were avoided in the Bible. Chakutera's father is dead, as are her two younger siblings. Her mother died just last month and is buried here in this rough grave. The stigma of AIDS has cost Chakotera her childhood and nearly her life. The disease scares people. They're worried its victims are cursed. So she's left to fend for herself, living alone in this small hut with a mat and an old blanket. Sometimes the weather is cold, nights are cold. I mean, would that be enough to keep her warm? Or is this little girl like to shiver many nights? No, it's not enough. You can see that she doesn't even have much on her own body. The clothes are torn. And um, it's very cold now. I mean, the temperature sometimes drops to about 4 degrees, 6 degrees. And my fear is, you know, there's no door here. Anybody can break in and they can rape her or they can bribe her with money so that she can get food for the next day. These three programs have shown how the church in Africa is responding to the AIDS pandemic and how a life center can provide so much help to widows, orphans, and those who suffer from the disease. Living Truth thanks you for your investment in life centers in Africa. Now, if you've got your Bible, I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. And then to verse 10. If you know 2 Corinthians at all, you'll know it's a letter in which Paul talks a lot about the struggles that he's been through and is going through. 
some of these circumstances that had been very hard for him, and yet in which he'd experienced the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that was fresh and real and deep. And in chapter 12 and verse 7, he talks about something which I'm going to read and then keep your Bible open. We'll refer back to this that uh, I think is very significant and important for us to understand. It says in verse 7, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, he's referred to those earlier, to keep me from being conceited, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul responds this way, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so the Christ power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now keep your Bible open there. I have in my hand a little silver coin that has written on it 1,000 metikais. That probably doesn't mean much to you. It's worth about eight cents. And this coin was slipped into my hand two Sunday mornings ago at the end of a service in a church in Mozambique at which I had preached. And the young man, probably aged about 20, when he gave it to me, said, keep this in your pocket to remind you to pray for Mozambique. I've had in my pocket since. Mozambique, to all appearance, this is a very sad country. It's ruled for many years by the Portuguese. And then there was a change of government in Lisbon in the mid-1970s, and the Portuguese, pretty well overnight, left their African territories at that time, Mozambique, Angola, Portuguese Guinea, they left Mozambique to sink into a long civil war which devastated the country and only in the last decade as they, as they begin to rebuild after that devastation only to find themselves ravished by the HIV pandemic that is destroying much of Africa. In most of the United Nations world rankings, Mozambique lies in the bottom ten. It didn't used to be. But it does now. In the service at which the young man gave me this coin, I, before I preached in the morning service, I'd been taken to the home of the pastor, a very simple home. And the gentleman who took me there is an evangelist, and he was going to translate for me, and he spent the several days in Mozambique with us the whole time, a wonderful man of God. Again, a young man, about 30 or so. We went to visit the pastor. He couldn't speak English, and so this man translated for me. And uh, I said to him, how is the church going here in this area known as Gondola? And he said to me, our church is experiencing revival because of the HIV AIDS pandemic. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. I needed him to explain that to me. And I'm going to explain it to you in a moment. But as a backdrop to a very important truth about the work of God, not just in some distant place in Africa, but about the work of God in your life and the work of God in my life as well. And it's this, that the very things that often put us flat on our back, that leave us with a sense of helplessness and sometimes with a sense of despair, are the very things that bring us nearest to God. 
God is most real in our lives in the areas of our deepest need and deepest despair. That is what Paul writes about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He talks about the fact that something bad has come into our life, uh, into his life, but he doesn't tell us what it is, but he is unambiguous as to where it comes from. He calls it a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. There's no doubt about its origin. It is satanic in origin, and there's no doubt about its purpose in Paul's mind. It's designed to torment me, and it's painful. Is a thorn in his flesh. Now, he doesn't tell us exactly what, he, what it is. Maybe it's something physical. Maybe some physical disability of some kind. We do know, reading in Galatians, that Paul evidently had poor eyesight. He wrote a sort of postscript. He dictated the letter, as he did most of his letters. A little postscript that says, See with what, with what large letters I write you with my own hand. Because he writes with large letters, seemingly because his own sight was so very poor. And he says to the Galatians, that when I was with you, my illness was such a trial to you, that some of you would have torn out your own eyes and given them to me. And so it's pretty likely that Paul had a problem with his eyesight in some way. Maybe he's referring to that, or maybe to some other disability. Maybe he's referring to his circumstances. Paul spent a lot of his time in trouble, and he talks about a lot of that when he wrote to the Corinthians in this second epistle. Let me read you just one instance. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 5, when we came into Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest, and we were harassed at every turn. We had conflicts on the outside and fears on the inside. This is a very honest apostle, isn't it? You know, we were tired. We were harassed. We had conflicts outside, and inside we were full of fears. Just the previous chapter, he talks a bit about his own experience as an apostle, and he says in verse 24, Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. That's thirty-nine lashes. Five times I received those. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I've labored and taught. I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I've been naked and hungry in the midst of all these... The, these uh, traumatic experiences I've been to, maybe he's referring back to those, and maybe he's saying, wherever I go, the devil is on my back, tormenting me, beating me, flogging me, giving me a hard time. Maybe he's referring to his circumstances. It could be that he's talking about the thorn in my flesh being something in his old nature, some besetting sin, because the word flesh, Paul often uses to refer to that old sin nature that we have. And maybe he's saying, you know, I am battling with something in my life that I know is wrong, but I battle with it. And most of us know what that's like. I wrote a book on Paul once, and I looked at the commentaries on this, see what they had to say about the thorn in the flesh. And uh, there were all kinds of suggestions. Some suggested that maybe it was the fact that Paul wasn't married and this was a thorn in his flesh and he wishes he was. And somebody else suggested maybe it's evidence that he was married and that was a thorn in his flesh. <laughs> I'm actually glad Paul doesn't tell us what it is. I'll tell you why. If Paul said, you know, my eyesight is such a problem, it's a thorn in my flesh, we, we would say, here we have a, a verse for blind people. But actually, he doesn't tell us. I'll tell you why. Because one size fits all. And sitting here this morning, you know what it is in your life. That is a thorn in your flesh. That is not a good thing. It has the fingerprints of Satan all over it. It sometimes drives you to a point of despair. You know, like Paul does, what it is to cry out to God and say, God, take it away. And it seems that there's no answer from heaven. That's very much an apt description of the HIV-AIDS 
situation in Africa. Twenty years ago, most of us had never heard of AIDS. It was first identified in 1985 in Uganda, where about a hundred people had died over a short space of time, and they'd all seemed to wither away. They called it slim. That was the first casual name that was given to it, because they wondered why it was that these folks were getting thinner and thinner and dying. And they sent a team of doctors down to try and investigate what it was, and they discovered the um, HIV uh, virus and then realized that similar things were happening in other places and they traced the sort of epicenter of this to a place that borders with Rwanda, Uganda and Zaire. But then it wasn't big news, it didn't become big news until the gay community in North America began to be impacted significantly, identifiably, and it suddenly became a big item of news less than 20 years ago. When I was in Malawi, a newspaper carried as the headline of one article, 250 new cases of AIDS diagnosed every day. Malawi has a population of 12 million people. If you project that on to the Canadian population of about 30 million, that would be an equivalent of 625 diagnoses every day in Canada. And by the way, not everybody is diagnosed, not everybody gets to a doctor, not everybody has a diagnosis, they just die, nobody knows what it is, but they've never been officially diagnosed. But let's say 625 in a Canadian equivalent, that would be over 4,375 people every day diagnosed with AIDS. All of them are going to die of the disease prematurely. That would be like 10 jumbo jets crashing and killing the passengers every week in Canada alone. You would think if that happened, we'd take this rather seriously, wouldn't you? One statistic says there are 2 million orphans in Uganda alone. And life expectancy in that country is now 38 years. That is half of the life expectancy of Canada. In fact, in those southern African region of countries, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Swaziland, Mozambique, Malawi, Zambia, life expectancy is below 40 years all across that area now. And across Africa as a whole, there are nearly 15 million orphan children. Those are estimates to some extent, but that is what is anticipated with the current figure, and it is growing so quickly in the next two or three years that is expected to double to 30 million orphan children. There are widows rearing children without a breadwinning husband, without resources, some of them HIV positive themselves and knowing they're going to die. I spent time in one home of a mother and seven children. The eldest was 15. The husband had died. She's HIV positive. She's very thin, very weak, very sick. She will not live very long. And while we were there, one of the boys in the family had found a nest of mice to his great joy. Killed six mice, brought them home, had cooked them, had gutted them, because as they explained, the gut is sour. They gutted them, cooked them with their fur, which had burned away in the cooking process, and then ate them whole, bones and all. And this was the first protein they had for days and days. I went into several child-headed households where in one case a 15-year-old boy looking after two siblings, 12 and 9, parents have been dead for three years and they just look after each other. He was 12 when he became the head of the household. Another girl whose parents and siblings have all died, she is 13 years of age, she lives alone, she thinks she's 13, she doesn't know her birth date because the parents died without having told her what her birth date was and she has no certification, no documentation. She thinks she's 13. She lives alone in a little hut infested with termites. No possessions but a ragged blanket. She has a grandmother a couple of kilometers away. She visits her once a week and gets a meal there. She eats about once every two days. And these aren't hard to find. 
People like that are all over Africa at the moment. In some rural areas, I was with some boys, teenage boys, who trapped and killed a rat. I have a picture of one of the boys holding it up with a big smile on his face. This will be his supper, and he's so excited to have caught a rat that he can eat. Who's behind all this? You can be absolutely no doubt who's behind all this. These are messengers of Satan sent to torment. Destructive. Jesus said about Satan three times, he is the prince of this world. John writes in his letter, 1 John 5.19, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Paul wrote in Galatians 3.22, the whole world is a prisoner of sin. And we don't have to go far to see it. And you and I are affected by it. We are under attack from the devil. There are battles in your life. There are battles in mine that are satanic in origin. These messengers of Satan, as Paul describes them, are roaming and seeking to destroy all the time. These are realities of life. So what do you do? Well, of course, we do what Paul did. It's the obvious thing. You ask God to take it away. Paul says that three times I pleaded with the Lord. Not just I prayed three times. I would imagine this means over three periods of time. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Take it away. And you could pray and plead with confidence because you know this is from Satan. Its purpose is to torment me. This is not from God. This is not the will of God. There is nothing godly about this. There are only things about this which are evil. It is obvious what to pray for with confidence. Lord, take it away. You have things in your life, no doubt, that you pray like that about. Things that leave you seemingly flat on your back, feeling beaten, you cannot cope, and you say to yourself, if I could get rid of this one thing in my life, I'd be free, I'd be liberated, I'd be a different person. And if God is a God of love, of course he's interested in taking it away. That's the logic, isn't it? But God's reply to Paul is astonishing. His reply to Paul is, No. Let me read verse 8 and 9 again. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, you have a misunderstanding here. Your misunderstanding is a very easy one. You think there is power in being strong. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? You think there is power in being efficient. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? But Paul, my power is made perfect in weakness. It doesn't mean, I must say, that God doesn't take away things. There are times that he does in his sovereignty. He takes things away that are, that are bad. But there are times equally in his sovereignty and in his love and in his grace, he leads us with these things because that is going to be the very point in which we are going to discover power and strength and grace. And almost certainly, in the lives of all of us here this morning, I don't have to be smart about trying to apply this. You're already thinking about the very things in all likelihood. It is a thorn in the flesh to you. And the thinking is for God to get rid of it, that would be reasonable, that would be his kindness, that is what God would do. But actually, again and again, the work of Satan, and he is unambiguous, it is a work of Satan, becomes a highway for God into our lives, into our experience. Let me take you back to the HIV AIDS crisis in Africa for a moment. I do not believe for one moment that God is behind the AIDS pandemic. Not at all. It's spread. It has been largely through sexual promiscuity. These are not godly things. 
There has been ignorance of the mind of God about such things. There has been disregard for the will of God about such things. There has been sin right in the very heart of the whole pandemic. God is not the source of AIDS. Then God was not the source of the thorn in Paul's flesh. It is a messenger from Satan. But God in his sovereignty is never beaten. And sometimes the things that put us on our back, even bad things, are the means of bringing us into a new dependence on God and a new experience of God. You know, Paul wrote in Romans 8.26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. But what if you don't admit your weakness? Well, if we try to live with this facade, everything is fine, everything is neat, everything is under control. You'll never know the Spirit of God helping you. It's the point of weakness. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. What if we don't acknowledge our vulnerability? I'll tell you what does happen. You remain on your own, independent of God, not dependent on God. I believe we in the Christian church need a proper theology of weakness. We need a proper theology of brokenness. We need to understand that our extremities are again and again God's opportunities when we acknowledge them. I asked this pastor in Mozambique, how has AIDS been the means of revival in your church? He said, I'll tell you how. At first, along with everybody else, we denied AIDS. And AIDS is very easy to deny. Somebody contacts HIV, which is a human uh, immunodeficiency virus. That then leads to AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. That is, the immunity in a person's body becomes broken. And so they're unable to resist the sickness and the disease that comes as a normal part of life. And they become especially vulnerable to sickness. And they are unable to respond to it, but it's not AIDS which is seen as the killer, but the sickness that AIDS prevents them responding to. So, for instance, somebody might die of uh, typhoid or TB or just the flu or diarrhea, and that is legitimate to say that is the cause of death because that is, those were the symptoms of the disease, but normally a healthy body would have been able to respond, the immunity would have responded to it, but because the immunity system has been broken, they're unable to respond. And so he said, what we decided to do in our community, people were dying all around us, and nobody was saying it was AIDS, because there's incredible shame associated with AIDS. And so we decided as a church, we would call it AIDS. That was the first thing. We decided to be honest. And we went into our community and said, we have a problem with AIDS. Not typhoid, not diarrhea, not the flu. The problem is AIDS. And we would talk about it. We'd encourage people to admit it. We'd go into the homes of the sick and the dying and sit and talk with them. And we would get them to admit, this is the problem. I have AIDS, therefore my wife needs to be tested. But if it's just the flu... Nothing to do with your wife, but you see, if you've got AIDS, it's like your wife has been infected too, so she needs to be tested so we can begin to help her before the symptoms manifest themselves. He said, when we did that, we then decided we have to do something about the sick and the dying and the widows and the grandparents who are looking after grandchildren when they have the energy and they haven't got financial resources and they haven't even the ability to work but they're supposed to provide food sometimes for more than one orphan family, sometimes two or three, all living with the grandparents because the parents have died. We began looking after orphan children. We began to help the child-headed homes. We asked what are their needs, and we said to our congregation, we need people to commit themselves. You need to commit yourself, not just to going down on a Thursday night. This is a life commitment So these kids have left home and got married, and they're on their own. And so we want you to commit yourself to these child-headed families. We want to commit yourself to this dying person. We want to commit yourself to these sick children. We want to commit yourself to these grandparents because they're not going to last forever and we're going to get alongside. It's going to be a 10-year, 15-year commitment you're going to make. And the church began to commit and as they began to get involved 
And as they began to talk about prevention as well, because they began to say, if this is AIDS, it is preventable, and these are ways in which we have to prevent it, and prevent its spread. It brought new compassion to our own people. It brought new prayer to our own people, he said. It brought new honesty to our own people. We weren't honest about our own needs, let alone other people's needs. When we called AIDS, AIDS, it was easy to talk about our own sin as well. And there was a fresh honesty that blew into our church. New life came into our church. Instead of shame and silence about things we didn't like, we became open and honest about them. That, by the way, is why confession is at the foundation of God's work in our lives. When we confess our situation, our sin, our need, when we acknowledge it, we can find help. And he said, we began to find renewal in our own church. And then what began to happen was the people in our community said, you're the people who are helping us here. And they began to come to us. And they began to come to Christ. And so there was renewal in our own church and revival in our community because there are people who flock into our church and a lot of our converts now are HIV, AIDS infected people. And he said, we're having revival because we're honest and we said we're going to do something about it. And what we discovered in our own church is that we don't experience revival outside of serving other people. And that is so important for us to grasp. We'll never experience true spiritual renewal simply by sitting, listening to sermons, by engaging in Bible study, by expressing our worship to God, all of which is important. But out of those things, going to serve the needs of other people and being the vehicle for God's activity in our own society and discovering God can actually use me. Then you find a whole new flow of spiritual life. Our Christianity ceases to be about our doctrines and our belief, but about a channel by which God can reach other people in our lives and in our community. That's why being missional, that's a new word that's been around for a little while now, but it's a very good word. Being a missional church is indispensable to being a spiritual church. Because who, where do you find spiritual life? In serving. And God flows through you. You know, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, the same letter, earlier in chapter 1. I'm going to read you a few verses. He wrote there in verse 3. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, listen, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Let me pause there. So when God comforts us in our need, why? So that the blessing that God has brought to us, we can bring to others. In other words, we become a channel of what God does in us for God to do through us. But when we're interested in just in what, what God will do in me, but not interested in what God will do through me, it becomes sterile, And then, he goes on to say, For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. Interesting. We're distressed. I would grumble about that. We're distressed. Why? For your comfort, for your salvation. But out of that distress, God brings something to you. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to, to endure, so that we despaired even of life in In fact, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death, but this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. So Paul says, let's get over looking at our problems as our enemies. Our problems become our friends. Why? Because they drive us back to God. 
When people are laid flat on their back, for whatever reason, they're probably at their closest to God as they'll ever be. Because this is not weakness, we experience Him. There is a consensus amongst those who are far more involved than I am in the HIV AIDS crisis, but the consensus is that HIV AIDS presents the greatest single opportunity for the Church of Jesus Christ today in the whole world. It's very easy to take a stance that is simply looking down the nose and judging. Very easy. We see the dirty fingerprints of Satan all over it. But it's the, probably the greatest single opportunity for the Church of Jesus Christ if we would see that in the very weakness and vulnerability and the destruction and crisis that this is causing. It's the place into which God himself can step. It's not that God is not interested in our comfort or in our freedom from trouble or our freedom from pain and our freedom from the things the devil brings against us. It's not he's not interested in that, but he has a bigger objective and his bigger objective is that the things in which the devil knocks us down might be the very thing in which we discover his strength in our weakness. His power is made known, not in taking away the thorn. Now, that's the popular idea. Experience the power of God. Make everything right. Take everything away that's bad. That's a sort of popular notion. It's not actually the New Testament notion at all. The New Testament notion is that in this area of weakness, God will show himself strong. The thorn that comes from Satan becomes a highway for God into our lives into our experience. When I was in Malawi, I went to a community where widows were being ministered to. There were about 60 of them, all ages, from old to young. Most of their husbands had died of HIV AIDS and most of these women themselves were HIV positive. As we came into the village where they were, they greeted us with uh, tremendous singing and dancing. It went on and on and on, and uh, I got pulled in, had to dance with them. You would have been very impressed. I told the cameraman to switch the cameras off at that point, but they didn't. It's a group that Rita Prince is doing a tremendous work with. And as they sang, and it went on probably an hour of singing, dancing, and not many songs, just the same songs repeated, 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 and then another one. But when the songs they repeated and repeated and repeated, Teresa, who I referred to earlier, Teresa, who is the Malawian lady who is overseeing that ministry, she said to me, let me translate what they're singing. And I wrote it down. What they're singing was this. I used to think there was nothing left. I looked behind me and it was all gone. I looked to the sides and there was nothing. 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 I looked ahead. And it was empty, empty, empty. But then I looked up to the heavens, and there was hope. There was love. There was purpose. There was Jesus. Now I have everything I need. And with phenomenal enthusiasm, they sang it again and again 
and again. I looked behind me, nothing. I looked beside me, nothing. I looked ahead, it was empty, empty, empty. I looked up to the heavens and I saw love and I saw peace and I saw purpose. And I saw Jesus. Now, that thing with grit, now I have everything I need. And as those words were translated to me, I looked into their faces. Women who had nothing humanly, materially. Women who have shed many, many tears. I look into their faces. Now I have everything because I've looked up to the heavens. And it made me weep, I have to confess. I've discovered in my weakness, Jesus. You know, your weakness is God's biggest opportunity in your life if you'll bring it in honesty before him. What is the thorn in your flesh? That's a messenger from Satan, so you're embarrassed about it. What is that thing sent to torment you? The great temptation, God take it away. And when God hasn't, you start to think, maybe he's not listening to me. Maybe he's not interested in me. Maybe he's not answering my prayers. But maybe instead, listen. And he does hear our prayers, but he answers. And his answer isn't always to do what we want. He says what Paul heard after pleading three times. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And maybe this very thing you'd love to get rid of is the very means by which God is making himself strong. This is not to justify HIV AIDS. This is not to prove it. This is not to say it's a good thing. None of those things are true. But it is to say that they are, the Church of Jesus Christ is discovering in Africa that in this messenger from Satan, in this incredible weakness and sadness, and the devastating devastation is bringing to the whole economies of these countries, because so many able-bodied people are dying prematurely, in all the devastation for those who look up to the heavens and find Jesus, they discover in this weakness I experience Him more than any other way. Maybe the increasing moral and spiritual bankruptcy of our nation, and I'm talking now about our nation and our world, with its roots in that which is corrupted and evil, might be the means of putting us flat on our backs when the only place we can look is up. And in your own situation this morning, will you dare to stop asking God to take away your troubles and instead thank Him that His grace is sufficient and His power is made perfect because you are weak. And then you can say with Paul in verse 10, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. I won't hide it. I'll boast this, although it's from Satan. I'll boast that here is an avenue in which Christ's power may rest on me. And if this is true of some of the African church and the African scene, it is true because it's a principle that applies to you and applies to me. Let's forget about trying to get it all together and be everything in the garden's lovely people. Let's be honest that it isn't. Let's be honest that we're weak. Let's be honest that we struggle. Let's be honest that we despair, as Paul says, even of life itself sometimes. Let's be honest there are conflicts outside and fears inside. Let's be honest. We are messed up. And say, Lord, in this weakness, Please make yourself strong. That's why God always uses broken people. And we don't like to be broken people. That's why
But God uses weak people. We don't like to be weak people. But I've said to you before, from Jeremiah chapter 7, we cannot be too weak for God, but we can be too strong for Him. We cannot be too simple for God, but we can be too clever for God. We can't be too poor for God. We can be too rich for God. Because what Jeremiah says there is, let not the rich man boast in his riches. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the strong man boast in his strength. You can be too wise, too strong, too rich. Let them boast about this, that they know me. And sometimes it's out of weakness and poverty and their own folly that we come to know him. Because that's where we despair. And as we close this morning, I don't know how God has spoken to you. I don't know how God has prepared you this week by bringing you to the end of yourself in some way or putting you flat on your back in some way or you pulling your hair out in some way saying, God, why don't you change this situation for me? His word to you this morning is because that is the very means by which I will make myself strong if you will trust me. And say, Lord, because I'm weak. Because I'm weak. I trust you. Next week, Join Living Truth as we begin a new series, Living from the Inner Core. Charles Price teaches about the unrighteous acts of righteousness from the Sermon on the Mount. To send us your comments and for more information about Living Truth, visit our website at livingtruth.ca.